Assalamualaikum everyone and thank you for joining me again for this journey into the most magnificent ayat of the Quran, which is given the um, honor that it is called I can perceive the words of the throne. And we have talked a lot about how the throne is where Allah places himself. So in the Quran, Allah SWT says in one of the verses that I was I, I made the world in six days and then I went on my toe. And we wonder how uh, Allah can talk about himself in a way as if he's in a form. Like, like as if Allah even talked about his face in the Quran, wherever he turned into the face of God. Allah even talked about his hands, um, you know, that he fashioned Adam with both his hands. So why why are we hearing about God in these forms when he's talking about this throne and hands and face. So what I understand from it is that because for us, these symbols mean something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to make us understand that I am doing these things, I'm doing this work. But he is not in that form, but that he's performing the essence of that particular organ. So for example, he says he fashioned Adam with both his hands. That means there are two, there are two aspects to Adam: the masculine and the feminine, the dark and the light, the sin and the good deed. The um, the so so these are the two aspects that that the two hands um, represent. So it's a metaphorical conversation. Um, in the same manner, when we talk about Adam to see as the throne, we understand that. Um, the throne, Allah SWT, when he says that I created the world in six days, the earth, the earth in six days, and then the world in six days, and then I went on the throne, to me, it looks like a process. To me, it looks like a way in which Allah SWT is talking about a journey, creation and reaching God. Okay, and for me, I'll for a few minutes. I know time when we want to leave. 9.30, go to 10 maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we see that when, we, when we're looking at these six yes. days and the throne, uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is pointing towards the journey. So in in our journey to in Islam, what do they do when they? Let me just proceed. In in Islamic journey, we see that there are the seven nafs, nafs amara, nafs alwama, nafs mulhuma, and we've discussed these uh, these nafs in detail, which we have equated to the six seven chakras in the Hindu tradition. Now, if we look at the six chakras, we see that it starts with fear. It's Muladhara, the red chakra. It starts with the fear. Fear that, that some, the chakras are of alignment if you are in a lot of fear. And then it goes into the sacral chakra and then the solar plexus. And so we keep moving upwards until we come to the throat. And after the throat, we have... Uh, the second last chakra, which is the third eye chakra over here, and then the crown chakra is over here. Now, if you look at this, it's called the crown chakra because it's as if the king sits on the throne with the crown, right? The, the 
king is sitting on the throne with the crown, the crown chapter. When our understanding of God reaches this level of enlightenment, then we have placed God on the throne. We have placed God on the throne. We have allowed him to be the master of our life. And we have allowed him to take our affairs in his control. That's why they say that the wali of God, the awliya Allah, la hawkun alayhim wa la hum They have no fear and they have no worry. Why is it that they have no fear and they have no worry? Because now they made God the king of their affairs. They, now Allah the wise, Allah the, um, the loving, Allah the one who knows the, everything is the one who is in charge. So if we move ahead in our uh, the, in, in uh, move ahead and read the translation of Isaiah, and we can read from here. So there, Manu and him. Yes. So. Allah, there is no God except Him. Allah is the living one, the all sustainer. Hayyul Qayyim. To Him belong whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. Who is that may intercede with Him except with His permission? He knows that which is before them and that which is behind them. So I want to take this theme into our conversation today, in which we are seeing that. Radhavanatala is talking about the uh, the ideas of intercession and he's talking about heaven and earth. Whenever I talk about heaven and earth, I always say that for me, the earth is the physical journey, the earth is the body, the physical human experience uh, that we have, and heaven is the ascended experience of the soul. Heaven is where uh, we enter our inner realms and we are able to ascend in our journey towards the last one. Tala. So the the human being is made up of two parts, the, the body and the soul. When we talk about the earth, we're talking about the body. When we're talking about the heavens, we're talking about the soul's journey. What is happening with the soul? So Allah SWT is the one who is saying that he knows that which is Sorry, he says that, um, yes, he, to him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. Now, we've been constantly talking about the microcosm and the macrocosm. And we understand that whatever is outside of us is within us. Because the Quran is saying, Whatever is in the horizon is also within you. I put my sign, my ayat. Now, the interesting thing is that I like using the, the word ayah. Then ayah, we usually say are the verses in the Quran. There are verses in the Quran, and then there are which are signs of God. Ayat are, are taken as signs. So sanurihim ayat in afilafati. My signs are in the heaven, heaven. Ufuk. Afa has my signs, my ayat, my verses. So the ayat of God, the signs of God are within this book Quran. The signs of God are in the horizon and the signs of God are in our self, within us. There is a triangle, there is a three-way reflection of reality, of what Allah's signs are. Now when Allah says, talks about the ayat, he says, those who reflect, only they can understand my signs. Those who are going to think about it, they're going to ponder over it, they will understand my signs. Now, if you look at the sign language where they talk like this, right? I don't know the sign language. When they're talking, when, when they express the sign language, you know, they're moving their hands to show some signs. When you see the signs, signs are not enough. They don't tell us anything, right? You have to understand what that sign means. What is the message behind that sign? What is the deeper meaning behind that sign? So when Allah is saying that uh, to me belong the heavens, whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth, there is a deeper meaning to heaven. I don't dare you can listen to this. There is an understanding that we need to uh, uh, perceive which is beyond just the physical, the just the surface. So the heaven is our spiritual journey and the earth is our bodily journey. And Allah is saying that I'm aware of everything. 
Now, when we move ahead, he says that who is it that may intercede with him? Okay, he's talking about intercession. Okay, Shafaat actually. The word that is being used is Yashfaw. Who is it that may intercede with him except with his permission? I would like to read out the actual uh, root uh, meaning of the word Yashfaw for all of you. Because it is very important to understand um, this meaning of the word Tavasur. Okay, so over here it says um, that uh, Yashfa will come from the word Shafa, Sheen, Fa, Ain. And the meaning is to make even that which was odd, make double, pair, make a thing to be one of the pair, adjoin a thing to its like, provide a thing which was alone with another, protect, mediate. And uh, so it also has the word likeness and similarity. Now, what is likeness and similarity? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, no one can intercede except with his permission. Now, uh, the, the word yashfa means that someone is becoming like another. Two things are becoming similar to each other. They're looking like each other. They're becoming... They, they are becoming a double, they're becoming a pair. So if you look at um, a pair of feet, you will see that one foot is a mirror image of the other foot. If you look at my both hands, you will see that both my hands look similar, but they are mirror images. There's a mirror image of it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the real, the haq. He says that he has made human in his image. And when something is made in its image, the, the teachers, they say that Allah is the actual and the human being is the reflection in the mirror. So anything which we see in the mirror is never real. Anything in the mirror is always an illusion. It is something we are seeing which doesn't exist, right? There are no two people, but you see two of yourself. One is your own hand and the other is what you see in the mirror. So there is a reflection. Allah is the truth and hug. The human being was created in his image. Now when you are created in his image, then there are people who are able to find proximity to Allah, who were able to adopt the qualities of Allah, who became the masters of Uswatul Hasana, the best of character, the Holy Prophet and the, and the, and the friends of God, the Imams of God, the Nabi Allah, they are all those who are the best reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does Allah decide that someone will, will be able to do shafar is when the two become mirror images. Okay, they reflect each other. My hand, my both hands are mirror images of each other. Can you see that um, uh, this hand's thumb is over here, but this hand's thumb is here. It's not like this. It's a mirror image. And when it's a mirror image, it's a it's not the it's not the real, it is the reflection. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he will not allow anyone to intercede except with his permission, it is with his will that some of us, inshallah, can become a mirror image. All right. We cannot touch that hub and real, but we can get on a journey where we can start to look like that, to, to start to emulate, to start to become and become a mirror image. Now, when we try to understand this idea of mirror image, how is that shafat? How does that help us? Is that when we become like someone, that Ibn Arabi says, that Allah's insaf, Allah's judgment is that Things that belong to their particular position, to their particular home, on the day of judgment, Allah will do that 
pure judgment in which everything will it will be in its place. So there's a saying which says everything in its place and a place for everything. Right? Like ice cream will go in the freezer or unless I'm it's its place. Ice stays with ice, right? Uh, the same way the people whose characteristics match, they stay together. We say our vibe attracts our tribe. Right? So our vibration, what are we vibrating at? What is our frequency? What are our our thought. Now, there's a very famous saying. Um, it, it says that small minds discuss people. I just uh, read it out to you properly. So I don't need the rest of it. So, great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, and small minds discuss people. So, Wherever our frequency matches, that is the group of people we will choose for ourselves, or that group is going to choose us. In this dunya, I'm saying that over here, our vibe attracts our tribe. We we end up getting connected to groups of people where our ideas, our thought processes, our topics of discussion are generally understood, encouraged. In, they, they become a source of inspiration. We talk to each other, we get each other, we understand each other. Now, if somebody has grown up, you know, cursing, swearing, um, uh, and stealing, uh, threatening, if that has been their life, then, uh, you know, they, they will have a motto. They will say, world is a bad place, and you can't get anything done in the right way. You've got to take the wrong way to do these things. That is their motto. That is the way they work. That is the way they think. So all the people who vibe with that energy are going to align themselves with that kind of group of people because if that kind of person enters a dinner party where people are talking about justice and you know how how there are so many kind people out there, there are such nice things in the world, this person is going to feel out of place. This person is not going to feel like it is in its place. Everything in its place and a place for everything. So in all of this, we understand that what, what shapat actually means to pair with someone means is that you go and attach yourself with someone like you. Now, on the Day of Judgment, as it narrowly says, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be fair and just, and Allah will put people where they belong, in the groups where they belong, in the places where they belong. So if you look at it that way, you understand that we also are going to be part of groups where we feel a sense of belonging. So we need to be careful about who are we becoming like? What qualities am I emulating? What is my intention for life? What kind of people would resonate with my thoughts? All right? If my thoughts resonate with a higher frequency of those who are called the friends of Allah, who are called the lovers of Allah, who are the ones who are seekers of Allah, who are yearning for Allah, then I will become part of that group. But if I'm not uh, uh, tuned with that, if I'm not aligned with that intention in my life, then I will be, uh, I will be put together in a group of people who think like I'm thinking. My, my priorities are different. So um, recently in my class, um, it was a beautiful discussion on joy and happiness. And I'm studying the um, treatise of Ibn Sina on joy and happiness. And in that, he tells us four different levels of joy and happiness. And he says that the highest level of joy is of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself who is in the highest state of happiness. Okay, he's in the highest state of joy. So why is Allah in the highest state of joy? Is because um, Allah loves himself, loves his essence completely. He is in love with himself. Okay, this is what Ibn Sina writes. And I found it very interesting because generally when we talk about love and we talk about liking something, we shy away from saying I like myself. 
Um, so I really, really enjoy the food I cook myself. But generally, when I talk to people, they're like, I don't like my own food. I don't like to eat the food I cook. Um, sometimes I think people say it out of being humble. Um, and some people generally don't like their own uh, food. But I really enjoy it. So I say I, I really enjoy the food I cook. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he is in he is in love with his essence. He loves himself completely and wholly. Now, what that does is that how, that explains Allah's quality of being independent and asana. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so completely in love with himself, he doesn't need anyone else to love him. He doesn't need anyone else to validate him. He doesn't need anyone else to fill his cup. He loves himself completely. And when we understand this idea that all of us in the end, our need is love. And when that desire for love is filled, then we feel wholesome. We feel complete. It is enough. We feel enough. I am enough. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that I love myself completely and wholly and he doesn't need any love from outside. The second level of love and joy is of that wali of Allah who has not only found complete love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but also for himself. Okay. So the destiny of that wali was Allah and now they have completely fallen in love with Allah and they love no one else. And they love themselves. This is what Ibn Kina is saying. So, what is the difference then between Allah loving himself and this person loving himself? The difference is that Allah is infinite. So, Allah has this infinite cup which has to be filled with infinite amount of love, and Allah has infinite amount of love. So Allah's cup is infinite and Allah has infinite love and Allah is enjoying in a state of joy and essence. He is in love and the love is complete. There is no need for love outside, from outside because we understand that Allah is free from lack. Allah doesn't need anything. He is perfect and complete and whole and, and full. All right? There, are, there, are, there is nothing missing in him. He is infinite and he has infinite. The, the wali of Allah, who loves himself and Allah, that wali has a limited cup. The vessel is limited. It's a small cup. And through their journey and yearning and effort, they have filled this cup completely. All right? So now they have complete love. They have full love for themselves and for Allah. From Allah, they have the love. So now they don't need love from any other human being. They don't need it from their boss. They don't need it from their children. They don't need it from their parents. They don't need it from their spouse. They don't need outer validation or outer love. They are complete on their own. And then there is a third degree of uh, the, the joy in which Ibn Sina says that in the third degree, the lover is seeking the beloved. The lover, the wali of God, the friend of God is still in a state of yearning that love. If this love is not yet complete. This love has not reached its pinnacle where it's completely full. So now this value of Allah is in a process of reaching the fullness of love. And until it reaches its beloved, there is a yearning for the beloved. There is a desire for the beloved. Now, you know, those of us who were once engaged and you know, our, our fiancés were traveling or they were away or we felt an infatuation, but we were missing them. Even in that missing, there is a pleasure. There's a pleasure of missing, but it's also a lot of discomfort and pain of missing someone. So Ibn Tina says that this person who has not yet reached complete love is in a state of yearning. So he's saying love is separate, yearning is separate. Love you find when you have reached the fullness and yearning is the process where your love has not completed itself. And for this person, there is a pain of missing the beloved but also a pleasure of yearning. And then 
Once the journey gets completed and the distance is covered, then the third level of joy enters the second level of joy where you have united with your beloved and your love has become complete. So now we see that this process of joy and happiness involves level of becoming like someone so that you're close to that, that entity and you become like that entity and then you unite in that entity. Right? So intercession then means which group are you going to belong in terms of your level of love? Now, interestingly, what I found so remarkable in this explanation is that the person who is at a high level of faith is the person who is not seeking love from outside. The person who is at a high level level of faith does not seek love from outside. It is only because when we seek outer validation and we seek outer love and we seek outer support that we become dependent on these different sources of love and validation. When we become dependent on these different sources of love and validation, that is when we compromise on our principles we compromise on our journey to our destination. We compromise on the rights and the wrongs. Because sometimes compromise will give us what we want. We will be loved. We will be supported. And to stand up to truth, to stand up to, to our own authentic truth, to stand up to our journey to God, a lot of times we will be tried through al over the moon, from to our wealth, to our children, to our families, and like saying that I will test you to your wealth, the fear of losing your children. These are the tests. Now, if we don't have our attachments for our completion, for our fulfillment from these outer sources, then we will become samad. We will become denyas. We will become someone who doesn't need worldly support systems to enable us to do the right thing. We will not need outer, uh, you know, um, words of appreciation, outer words of motivation. There will be an inner source of love, inner source of motivation, inner source of completion, which will say, I don't need anyone to approve of me. I don't need anyone to say this is right or wrong. This is my truth. This is the hug and I believe it is so. Because I have that inner con conviction and connection. So in terms of our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we see that we want to become like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in order to become like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we see that Allah is in complete love with himself. The awliya Allah on their journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have these unveilings the wheels are lifted. And we a lot of times think that these unveilings are visions of light, of angels, of great saints, of beings, perhaps even demons. We think that. But in my understanding, each one of us is capable of going on this journey and each one of us is already on that path because Allah is saying in the Quran Ya Ayyuhal Insan Inna ka kaadihim kathan ila rabbika pamulaki All of you are striving to reach your God and you will for sure you are striving laboriously and you will meet your God. So all of us are constantly in a journey. We are in that process of moving towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in this journey now, we see that we are constantly perfecting ourselves in different ways. We're constantly speaking love, constantly trying to attain certain levels of uh, independence to when we get hurt from someone, when we get affected by somebody's word and, it, uh, and, and we feel upset. We don't want to feel affected by them. We want to become... Um, impenetrable. We want to become like, I want an armor around me so that people's words don't hurt me. So that if people don't love me, that it doesn't make me go in a slump, right? So that is becoming a samad. Like Allah is saying, my own love is enough for me. 
So in terms of our journey, the spiritual journey, the veil that we are constantly unveiling actually and we don't realize are the veils of self-realization when it comes to our negative qualities. So for example, you took a decision about it and you and your friend said, don't do it, it's not a good deal and you will lose money. But you say, no, I am confident that because of this reason or because of that reason, this is a good decision and you do it. And once you do it, you make a loss. You don't make profit in it. And then you just send a text message to your friend and you say, I know, I know, I made a mistake. Uh, or you say, I know, I know, uh, you said this business was not a good idea. I don't want to discuss it. Chapter is closed. I don't want to discuss it. And you don't admit that you made a mistake. Where is that coming from? It's coming from you seeing a flaw in yourself, realizing I took a wrong decision. That means uh, there's a flaw. There's a lack in my judgment. There was a lack in my wisdom. There's a there was a lack in my evaluation. And now I've seen the consequence of the lack which is within me, but I don't want to admit it. I don't want to accept it. I don't want to humble it. I don't want to avoid it. When we do this, we are denying that unveiling. We are denying the fact that Allah was showing to you something which was dark within you, something which was lacking within you, which could have been made better. So what do we see was the lack over here? That in terms of taking decisions, I did not have the capacity to even hear a second opinion and why this person was saying what they were saying and so there was a lack in my judgment. If I don't accept this, if I don't accept and say, yes, you were right, I did make a mistake, and I don't go back and say, how did you see what I couldn't see? Can you show it to me? Then you have missed out on an opportunity to uh, grow through that unveiling. What is an unveiling? An unveiling is when the human being becomes aware of something which is dark within themselves. And the reason we don't correct it, the reason we don't have the capacity to look at our flaws in the eye and say, yes, I was wrong, I need to fix it, I need to learn from my mistake, is because we don't love that part of us. We are disgusted by our mistakes. We are ashamed of our mistakes. We are unhappy with our mistakes. Almost like we turn our faces away from the parts of us that make us. And we don't have the courage to embrace that part of us which made a big mistake, maybe caused hurt to someone, like you gave, it, gave an advice for somebody's marriage that you should marry this person and it ended in a divorce and you just can't forgive yourself for doing it. Or you advise someone for a business deal and it ended up making them go bankrupt and you can't forgive yourself. The unveiling will happen when we see our darkness. And the growth will happen when we embrace our dark parts with love. The interesting thing is that when we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect and he loves himself completely. The other side of God is also that there is nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we cannot separate Iblis from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot separate the darkness is in the world, the demons in the world, the um, the chaos in the world, all of that comes from a loved one. It's in his will, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this quality that first of all, he is wise and whatever unfolds in the manifested world or the unmanifested world, it is in his will and in his wisdom. Hence, it is perfect. And hence, it is loved by us, whatever it is. So, one of the teachers uh, said that, yes, it is understandable that, you know, when you uh, had locked your doors in your house and you had checked the, the locks and you had done all your due diligence, and you went to sleep, and then burglars barge into your house and steal. 
You can turn around and say, yeah, I tried my best, it's good in the way of Allah. So what will you do when you forgot to lock your house and you forgot to latch the door and you forgot to check the locks and perhaps you were careless and you went to sleep and then the burglar barred into your house. And can you understand that that too has happened with the will of Allah and holds something good in it? It does not happen without the will of Allah. There is a perfection even in that act. And although it sounds counterproductive, it is also something to learn and grow from. It is also a challenge in life which can teach us a lot. This is also a challenge in life which can bring a lot of ascension in the soul to understand, okay, I surrender to Allah's will and I accept this as part of His will as well. Now, a lot of times the reason we can't do that is because of the idea that I did it out of free will. Then where is the accountability? I mean, I was actually careless, right? And I did this mistake. So if I did this mistake, then I should take responsibility for it, right? But if I separate myself and I say it was entirely my own doing, and I was the only culprit responsible for this mishap, and I'm actually cutting myself off from my source. I cannot do anything without Allah's help or will or his permission. So even if I want to separate myself, I cannot. But the way to understand ourselves and the way to improve ourselves and the way to grow is to be in a constant state of tazkiyah in us, in a constant state of analyzing ourselves and analyzing our intentions and saying, did I deliberately leave the doors open? Did I want a mishap to happen? Am I so malicious in my thoughts or so walked in my thoughts? Did I deliberately and intentionally want, want a harm to come my way? No, I didn't. Of course not. My intention was not bad. My intention was not in the wrong. And Rasulullah said, Inamal amalu dinya. So, the dependence of action is on its intention. So now if we understand that in order to attain shafa'at, in order to attain this proximity to the friends of Allah, to be assorted with the friends of Allah on the day of judgment, to be judged and put in our place of adal and justice according to vibrating with the same energy, if that is what we want, then we need to understand that the awliya Allah were the ibn al -Wahd. They were the son of time. That meant that these friends of God are the ones who stay in the present moment with a lot of mindfulness and intentional life. So in the Quran, Allah says, Ma khalaqta jinna wal insa illa liya'budun. I did not create insan or jinn except that they worship me. You can't be on the Janama 24 7. It doesn't make sense. But worship. Illa liya'budun, to be ab, to be the servant of God, means that worship is a way of life. So, you know, like we have American idol, and then we have the idol worship. And when people worship an idol, for example, they worship a celebrity, that word worship means to adopt their qualities, their characteristics, and their, their, their preferred lifestyle. And so when we want to be in a state of worship, we don't want to worship any idols. We want to enter a place of completion within ourselves. We want to only and only have a connection with Allah SWT because the friend of Allah who experiences the second level, second highest level of joy after Allah is the one who finds complete love for themselves and love for Allah SWT. And in order to do that, we have to come into a complete acceptance of who we are. Am I, I, am I constantly 
saying to myself that I'm a bad parent. I'm not organized. I don't do this properly. I'm not consistent. You know, I I have this flaw, that flaw. We're constantly in a state of self-criticism, putting ourselves down and not accepting those parts of us or those mistakes and not forgiving ourselves. And we have not come into a place of complete love or completion or wholeness. And if we don't attain that, then our constituency does not match the constituency of the friends of God. Allah himself loves himself completely. The friends of God love themselves and Allah completely. And for us, the yearning ones, the seeking ones, it is very important that we understand the value of complete surrender to what Allah wills and complete acceptance of who we are in this moment. Becoming Ibn al becoming people of the present moment. And people of the present moment who are in complete surrender of the present moment. They're accepting the present moment in its entirety and saying, in this moment, whatever I am, whoever I am, Allah, I accept. And I, I am accepting what you have decided for me. I'm accepting. I'm in a state of surrender. I accept it. So when we do that, then we are changing ourselves, sculpting ourselves, making ourselves and coming to a state of becoming. Becoming that which aligns with the characteristics of the friends of God and the qualities of Allah Taala. And Allah's akhlaq is to be in complete love with himself. His akhlaq is to accept oneself completely with the flaws and the right, the, the dark and the light so that it can he so that it can come into completion. I will uh, conclude today's session over here with dua. Salaam Rahman Rahim. Salaam Masalala Muhammad Yuma Ali Muhammad. O Allah, we come to you with our weaknesses and shortcomings and flaws. O Allah, perfection is only for you. O Allah, forgive us for our imperfections. O Allah, help us in our journey towards seeking of this perfection. O Allah, humble our hearts and humble our journey. And help us to cross the bridges of our own interferences and our own obstructions. O Allah, let not myself become an obstruction in the way to you. O Allah, I seek your help and guidance. Do not leave me to myself. Do not leave me to myself. O Allah, Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. I'm going to stop the recording here if there are any questions.